everybody. Here in San Diego with Will Eubank, director of the Signal. It would really be helpful if I got my notes and everything open before I hit play. Um, we're si sitting on the floor. Yeah, we're sitting on the floor because the composition really looked ridiculous. And after all the horrible things I say about composition, far be it from me to, uh, to give you folks anything less than pleasurable. Um, all right, this is... Um, Oh, where to begin? Let's let's begin with a with a math question. If you had a dollar for every time someone called you you banks, how many dollars would you have? I would be a I would be a wealthy man. I would be able to self finance most of my <laughs> <your projects>. films. <laughs> now, anybody ever ask if you're Bob's kid? You know, uh, they, or they often ask, "Are we related?" And we actually, I always lived near him in San Inez or Woodland Hills. We always had a like when we moved around, they were moving around. We had we. Families both had black Broncos, so that made things even more confusing. Oh, that must have been fun when you bumped into them at the mall. Yeah, it was, very it was, confusing. It was weird. Um, let's talk about the opening of the film. First shots are really important to me. And I see the mechanical claw, and the way that sequence progresses, and how legs are incorporated into the opening credit sequence. I mean, you give out so much information. Uh, the running legs are replaced by crutches in the back seat, and all you have to do is watch the dialogue really doesn't have to, it's not all that important. So, but how important was it for you to get, well, obviously it was very important to get all this information out at the get-go. Yeah, I just, I, you know, it, uh, I don't know if it's a product of writing a project for a really long time, if things just start to weasel their way in and you start to get more and more into sort of metaphors for everything or, or what's going on. But, but it's important, I think, that there is a sort of, I don't know if it's just turned off, but no, it's not. It's, uh, okay. Pay no attention to that. Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, but no, it, it's important that I think that there are strings and 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 uh, sort of almost like veins that go to multiple things, so people can sort of pick and choose how they want to understand the film. I guess. And the claw was a terrific metaphor. Yeah. As, thank you. And the you claw know, I, I is kind of a metaphor too for for one other thing, if you think about it. All right. Like, I, I'm going to tell you right now, yeah, there, there may be a spoiler alert here or there, so you may want to sit and bookmark this and watch it later on. I'm going to try my best, but this is a tough film to discuss. It is, it is. Without yeah. discussing... You should watch the film and then come back and right, watch it. Right, yeah, and then, yeah, you're right, yeah, double your pleasure. I implore you to do that. All right. Is that the right You have a romance. Yeah, implore is good. Yeah. Yeah. You have a romance, there's some sci-fi, horror, action, a slasher film, and a paranoid thriller. What's the matter? You don't like horses and musical numbers? I mean, you cram so many genres yeah. into this piece. It's really impressive. I, I wasn't exactly trying to do that. That definitely wasn't the intention. I think that that just happens because I'm a fan of a lot of different things. Like, I like John Hughes. I like the Scott Brothers. I like, you know, weird sort of scary movies. I like Dragon Ball Z and anime. And, you know, somehow those influences sneak their way in and then... What ends up happening is if I have a scary moment, it's like, well, I want it to be scary, or I want it to feel like maybe a scary movie that I like that made me feel that way. And so inherently, the genres sneak in, and when you're not even really trying to, and suddenly you find yourself, yeah, just sort of going left and right and bouncing all over the place. But it wasn't exactly intentional. In fact, I didn't even know the term genre bending until I had made this film. And everyone was like, oh, it's such a genre bender. <laughs> really? You never heard that term? No, I'd never heard that term. Like, genre bend what? And then, you know, yeah, now I'm, now I'm an expert at genre bending. Right, yeah, you're the king. Yeah, I'm the a guy. genre bender. So you began uh, your career at Panavision. Man, I mean, that must have been terrific for a guy. Yeah, yeah it was cool. I, I didn't get into film school, so for me, it was a good way... What better film school? Yeah, yeah. And the, I owe so much to them. Bob Harvey, David Dodson, all those guys are, are just good dudes. They, they were all the guys who were allowing me to take the cameras out the back doors after work was done and letting me keep cameras at home for days on end. You know, they put a thing together at one point and they said I'd taken millions of dollars of free cameras out the back door. So I owe them a lot. And they would send me out on shows and I would get to work on movies like Collateral as a digital technician. So for me, it was a cool film school. It was a great way you know, for a guy who had no connections in the industry to learn about the visual part, at least, of storytelling. Now, I haven't seen Love. Was that shot in scope? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so you, you are paying back. 
I, you know, well, I'm just hoping that I can, you know, at least tell people like where it all came from, and it, and it came from those guys. So. No, but you're paying back because you know how to use the frame. You know how to compose for the frame. Oh, I see. What this you're isn't saying, yeah. one of the, It's not a clothesline affair or a teeter totter. No, no, yeah, yeah. Just check. Yeah, you should definitely check out, or yes. at least check out the trailer for Love. Which and and good corridor stuff. Uh, I love corridor you. shots. <laughs> <Good> corridor. <laughs> great. And the music video that I, I'm blanking the name on. A lot of corridor stuff that you shot, but you've shot so many music videos. Going to be a little less specific. All right, right let's uh, let's move on. Let me talk to you about the time frame here. There are cassette tapes, tube television sets, pay phones, orange Samsonite attaché cases. Did, did your grandmother? Did, was that a party gift? Was she on the match game? <laughs> no. I mean, my God. And then there's a flat screen TV. Where are we? But that is that is very much for the. This is again. You should go watch the movie before you watch this. I've been asking you, but um, I like the idea that one. I don't know if you've the last time you've ever visited sort of a NASA or any one of these places, but sometimes don't they feel. Oh really? Oh yeah. Well, actually, so <laughs> no, okay, okay. No, no. Well, I don't even go to Disneyland. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> when often they feel a little bit dated to a certain extent, like they are being run by government grants and crazy things and. And I like the idea that for a second you're like, wait a second, where is this? Where is this occurring at? Is this some outdated facility? Is this some sort of left hook into Area 51? What is going on? And I always was sort of enamored with the idea of making a movie about Area 51 that didn't tell you it was about Area 51 until way later. And then whether it really is Area 51 or not, that's up for you to find out. But um, I'm very surprised that you revealed that. That was not something I was going to bring up. I thought that that would be well, kind of a, a, we a spoiler. Spoiler. That yeah. is, uh, hopefully people just don't watch it. <laughs> they don't. They don't watch yeah. my stuff anyway. But no, you know, it's like it's like one of those things though where uh, I, I don't mind the term Area 51, or at least that people could be thinking that because it's a yeah, government facility, like right off the bat, pretty soon of some sort. It seems like so to me. It's, um, I would pitch, I always used to pitch it to people like that. I would tell them, oh, it's sort of an Area 51 film. You don't realize it's Area 51 film. Because you don't really approach the movie with a sense of, uh, sort of all the social preconceptions you would have about something like that or what those cliches would carry. So, um, you know, it, it never really bothered me to say that. But All right, I thought that would be a surprise. The, this is a low budget film, obviously. Um, you do work in some terrific special effects, one we can't talk about, but one we can talk about. The best thing in the film for me is the way you light that aquarium on uh. Lawrence Fishburne's head. I've never seen that done before. It's like... Wait, which part? The, the, the aquarium helmet that he wears. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the way you light that, and when he's looking dead on at the camera at the beginning, and you don't know if it's CGI or... <laughs> Thank it you. looks like the head is floating, and that gives him such an... Onum, um, Ominous feel. Oh, uh, cool. I thought, uh, so how did you do that? Where did you find you know, those that, helmets? That, I'm just going to, well, the helmets came from a place called Global Effects, and we, we custom built those suits. Um, and Lawrence, bless his heart, he's a champion, a real lion heart of a man. Like, that, it was like 100 degrees, and he was wearing those suits a lot of the time. So he's, he's a champion. Two weeks of that, it was just like brutal. Um, but he never complained. And, and uh, Global Effects built those suits. Uh, they had the helmets already, and I think they're the same helmets-esque, or from the same molds as the movie Outbreak, maybe? Maybe. The Sean Connery film? No, with Dustin Hoffman, and, um... Oh, the yeah, movie called yeah, Outbreak. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if it's the exact same helmet, but similar. And then David Landsberg, he and his gaffer, um, came up with a great way to get some really small LED lights in there. We did our own lighting in there, dimmable and, and, and gelable so that we could get his face lit up just right. And it was funny because Brian Burdan, the editor, was like, gosh, if I could have every movie I ever do with a guy in a helmet like this, it would be great. There'd always be great light on his face, and you'd always hear what he's saying. And, you know. and he worked, uh, he, he edited a couple of Oliver Stone pictures. Yeah, Natural Born Killers. He came up under David Lynch. His first David Lynch, thing yeah. was yeah. Uh, assistant editor on Blue Velvet, and then he cut a lot of Twin Peaks. All right, speaking so. of David Lynch, where'd you find Mirabel? Uh, that she's awesome. She's she sure awesome. is. She knows she, how to do a, a yeah. strand of pearls. So <laughs> lucky to get her. She's such a doll. She. Um, it's a character in the film that's very, very much like someone out of Twin Peaks or Blue Velvet. Yeah, 
Yeah, very much so. And and Brian cuts that way. It's always interesting to see your footage put through Brian's filter later. But she uh, was an in Insidious, which is Brian Cavanaugh Jones, one of the producers on this film, called in, called her up, sent her the script, and she she was so ecstatic about playing it. She was like, "Of course, I'll do this." And she brought so much life to a character that I think people easily could have made cliche real quick. All right, you took courses on cosmology at UCLA. Give me one everlast everlasting bit of knowledge you took from your classes that made The Signal a better film. You know, um, I think the idea of perspective was always important. Like, I really liked I, that, that science film, I think Powers of Ten, where you, the couple is having a, a meal in the park, and you keep zooming out from them, Powers of Ten, until you're, like, somewhere outside the universe, and then... You, you go back in, zoom back in real quick, and then you go into their ham sandwich or something weird and you go inside Powers of Ten. And I thought that idea of perspective was always really cool. And I also, like, they always compared the universe to, like, a loaf of, you know, raisin bread, where the universe is constantly expanding, but it's not expanding from a single point, they think. It's expanding like raisins in a raisin bread would. Everything is just kind of expanding outwards from each other. I always thought that concept was really weird. And it always made me really hungry, so I thought it was cool. <laughs> All right. Um, handheld camera work is to contemporary cinema what a zoom lens was to 70s cinematography. True or false? Uh, true, I, I believe. All right. You, there's a lot of handheld stuff in here, and I here's, hate hand, handheld, but it's almost imperceptible. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I think I don't like too much handheld, but I do like a little bit. Now, what's really interesting is, and I don't remember his name, so this is quite awful, but we had, and I've never seen this before, but I, I feel like I witnessed something pretty spectacular. We had a cameraman who lived up in Santa Fe. He day played for us twice, and he had worked with Mr. Hitchcock himself, and uh, which is rare to find somebody who's still alive who actually yeah. worked with him. And, yeah. and this man uh, was a much older gentleman, really nice guy. Um, he came up to me, he day played for two days, and he came up and he said, all right, uh, do you want me to track them as they walk down to the gazebo? And I was so under pressure and all this other stuff, and it was that part where they're sitting by the picnic table. And I'm just thinking, track them, like he's on sticks and he's over there, what's he talking about? He's like, you know, I was like, yeah, yeah, what are, sh sure, you know. What, I was trying to envision what is he going to do, pick up the sticks and start walking with them, you know? <laughs> and so I'm, I'm watching, you know, somewhere else off the side of, of, of uh, you know, watching Video Village. And the shot follows Nick as he walks down to Haley. And he keeps to perfection the same frame size on Nick as he walks all the way down this hill by doing the longest zoom I've ever seen perfectly straight out of bullet or something. It was a classic 70s Zoom. That was like... You know, now that you mention it, I know what you're talking about. But that, that worked into the fabric of the film. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't someone who was just lazy, and instead no, of laying dolly no. track, they twisted the lens. Oh, no, they knew how to do it. And I don't, yeah. that's a lost art. I, to actually be able to follow somebody on a Zoom like that with your hand is, is a lost art. And to make it feel seamless is like... I, I couldn't believe I'd seen it. I was like, oh my God, that's a 70s Zoom. I was like, there's just nobody else who could do that but him, you know? So it's really kind of fun to watch. So what are your thoughts on 3D? Obviously you enjoy <clears throat> anamorphosis. What are your thoughts on 3D? Mm. I think certain films, it can be a lot of fun. I mean, I, I got to admit, I saw Gravity in 3D and IMAX, and that was, that was pretty cool. I, uh, the things flying right past your face, I thought that was an interesting experience. I usually go see my big comic book films not in 3D, though. Um, mainly because I wear glasses and then to put another layer of glasses on top of that just annoys the heck out of me. And I also don't like it when the film is a little darker. Mm -hmm. like I like to see things bright. And I don't like putting on the glasses and feeling like I've just put an ND filter on my face. So, um, not the biggest fan always, but you know, I guess some people are, so whatever. You know, if it lasts, it lasts. If it doesn't, it doesn't. All right, this is my, my favorite question to ask directors. Do you remember the first film your parents took you to see when you were a kid? Mm. Man. Ah, God, I, that is a good question. I mean, I almost feel like it was Hook with Robin Williams, but it had oh, to be. Didn't your parents love you? Yeah, I know. Those are things <laughs> before that. Um, you know, I remember some of the first stuff. Like, uh, uh, well, what's, the, what's the first film that you watched, as I always say, where you realized that the actors weren't making up the dialogue as they went along? That there was thought and intent, and oh, you man. said, I want to do this. Uh, well, that might have been Chinatown. That might have been Chinatown. When I realized later... Because there was a weird thing with me in Chinatown is I thought it was a period piece 
And then I put two and two together and I realized Jack Nicholson wasn't around in that time. And I was like, oh my God. They also didn't have anamorphic lenses back then. Either. Yeah, and I was like, <laughs> I was really just confused for a little bit there. Um, and I thought that was so interesting and Faye Dunaway just really captivated me. And, and I don't know, I just, I love the movie China. It's one of the greatest scripts yeah. ever written. There's not one false word. Every, every word, every gesture advances. Yeah. The, it's like The Apartment. That's another one. It's yeah, flawless. Oh, I gotta watch that. Okay. Oh, never seen the, the My Billy two Wilder favorite film? movies are, are Casablanca and then followed quickly by Chinatown. But Casablanca is so predictable. I know, but I just love it. I just love it. I love like the think thinking of hot Moroccan nights and gin joints. And... <laughs> so, what movies did you watch uh, as a refresher across to bone up uh, for the signal? You know, Twilight Zone. Uh, I hear. Yeah, it's Twilight like, Zone. Yeah. THX. Uh, Definitely. Yeah. Uh, you know, oddly enough, I, I watched uh, you know Black Hawk Down just for Black Hawk Down and, and the Scott Brothers, like Man on Fire. Yeah. Those are great. Very like I don't go that crazy with the camera, but they're really like inter. They 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 pick the right lenses. Those guys are so painterly. I just I think it's unbelievable. Um, no Country for Old Men, of course, because we were right in New Mexico, right in that area. Um, I watched Hannah because I thought yeah, I think Hannah's a really beautiful contemporary film too, and that's kind of comic booky. The uh, the Red Riding Hood. Yeah, well, there was Red Hannah. Yeah, the, that was the one with the young uh, Eric Bana and Tilda. Or is it Kate Blanchett or Tilda Swinton? You confuse them too. Yeah, yeah. Who directed oh, that? Uh, That's one. It's it's, it's it's Joel Carnahan, maybe. Uh, I know the Chemical Brothers did the soundtrack. Anyway, it's yeah. called Hannah. It's a really beautiful film. There's a scene where some of the driving footage in that is out of control, and they they do a lot of patchwork where they just put scenes together. It's a it's a really cool film. Really cool. Film. All right. Well, so some strange things. <laughs> is this your first time in San Diego? Uh, really, actually, down this far, yes. Uh, <laughs> down this far. Well, when I was doing the Angels, got to tell my relief. <laughs> yeah, when I was doing the Angels and Airways bit, I was in Carlsbad a bunch because that's where they're based out of. So. That was the video, the Angels and Airwaves. Yeah, video. They, that's the one yeah. that I saw, and that that has the great, beautifully lit color uh, corridors. Cool, yeah, yeah. yeah thank okay, you. Okay, all right, it, it comes full circle. <laughs> there you go. Thanks so much, Will. Hey, a thank real you pleasure for meeting me. you. Cheers. All right, someone help me up. <laughs>